Okay. Well, here is uh, a conversation we can have about the Battle of Trenton, one of the major turning point actions in the entire Revolutionary War. So hopefully we can have some fun with it. Well, you know, let's take a look at where George Washington is at the end of this Annus Horribilis, the, uh, the year 1776. You'll recall the year started out pretty well. We evicted the British from Boston. Washington rides triumphantly into the city. But uh, everything goes to hell after we write the Declaration of Independence and declare our independency from Britain. Uh, the Long Island and New Jersey campaign sees Washington lose every single battle in which he engages the British. So poor George Washington has lost now every single battle in his entire military career heading into the end of 1776. Oh no. So there's a number of problems that we're facing at this point. We've lost all of New York City, America's second largest city to the British. Most of the population of Philadelphia has, has fled because everybody expects Philadelphia to fall next. The Continental Congress has fled the city. They've gone to Baltimore. And George Washington has crossed to the, overside, the other side of the, the Delaware River. So he's in Pennsylvania. And the only thing that's kept Lord Howe from destroying Washington's entire command is that November has given way to December and it's winter time. And in the winter, armies of the 18th century stop fighting. You'd think that Washington's biggest problem at this point is the British army, but actually it's not. It's his entire army. So we're going to look at, at what the sides look like going into the, the Battle of Trenton. So on the right, you have the American army. That's about the entire size of the American army. That's, that's the Continental Army. It's shrunk to that size. Uh, there were different commands. Uh, General Gates had a few hundred soldiers and, and uh, Charles Lee, who has just been replaced, uh, replaced or uh, returned via prisoner exchange with the British, had, a, had a, a, a few hundred soldiers. But that's the size of the army. In, in a country of, of almost three million people, or just over three million people, uh, that's the size of our military. And it's really, really pathetic. Washington had started this war with something like 18,000 soldiers, which itself isn't that big. But at this point, having shrunk to that size, I mean, what accounts for that? Well, he lost so many men in the Long Island campaign and so many men in the New Jersey campaign. And on top of the, the soldiers that he lost because they were captured in battle by the British or they were killed in battle by the British, he's also lost soldiers to, de to desertion. You, you can almost understand some of these soldiers have been with him from the very beginning, from 1775, and they haven't seen him win a battle yet. And your general is, is a demonstrated loser, and you haven't been fed properly, and you're not getting paid, and you're, you're not being clothed properly. You know, um, a, uh, a contemporary was writing about Washington's arm, and he said, you can always tell where they are by following the bloody footprints in the snow. Now, these guys are walking without shoes and they're marching without rations. And so this is, this is where the American army is um, at the end of 1776. The British army is spread all over New Jersey and there are thousands of them. So the, the main headquarters is New York City. The local headquarters is in New Brunswick or what the British simply called Brunswick. But there are garrisons, meaning elements of the British army up and down the state. So there are units of the British army as far south as Bordentown. There are units of the British army uh, in Princeton. And there is a garrison of Hessian soldiers, those German mercenaries in Trenton. Trenton today we know is the capital of, of New Jersey, but it's a pretty important town even in the 18th century because it's where the Delaware River becomes navigable. Meaning you can sail up the Delaware Bay. And if you've ever been to Cape May, New Jersey, uh, you know exactly where the, where the Atlantic Ocean stops and the Delaware Bay begins. 
So when you start sailing up the Delaware Bay, then you get into the Delaware River and you can sail past Philadelphia. Uh, and then Camden would be to the to the east. Philadelphia would be to the west. And if you sail north of, of Philly and Camden, the farthest you can go in a boat is Trenton. So that makes it an, an important trade entrepot. It makes it an important place where uh, where trade happens in between Philly and New York and up the river. If you want to send goods from the Atlantic Ocean uh, up into New Jersey that far, you have to unload your boat at Trenton. So that's why the town kind of develops where it is. So there's a few hundred houses there. There's a couple of churches. There's a couple of factories. There's some barracks. So for winter quarters, the Hessians under Colonel Rahl uh, will kind of dig into Trenton. They don't build any fortifications. There's no trenches. There's no ditches. There's no ramparts or, or readouts or breastworks. It's, they're just living there in houses. That's not to say that Colonel Rahl isn't being careful because he's, he's worried about uh, a sneak attack from the other side of the Delaware. So he always leaves a company of soldiers on high alert that can spill out of their, their barracks at a moment's notice uh, and always keep their, their weapons loaded. And he has cannon with him as well. So that's what it looks like uh, going into the Battle of Trenton. Washington's biggest problem, however, is that his tiny army, his meager guard of something like 2,500 soldiers, is about to go. The majority of enlistments in his army are up on the 1st of January, 1777. So when 76 ends, if the British simply do nothing, and he does nothing. When that, when the, when we turn the page on the calendar, when the clock strikes midnight, his soldiers have the opportunity to simply leave legally, and there's nothing he can do to stop them. And and think about this for yourself: if you were a soldier serving in the Continental Army, why would you stay? You've never seen your general win a battle, and you haven't been paid, and you're and you're not getting enough to eat. One of Washington's aide de camp, one of one of his uh, staff officers writes him a letter and says, you know, your excellency, we have to do something bold because you haven't won a battle yet. It's at this point in the cold and the snow and the ice that Washington will make a fateful decision that's going to change the course of American history. And he comes up with a plan. His plan is we're going to wait for Christmas. Can't wait much longer because if we wait till New Year's, the war may be over. We'll wait for Christmas. Under the cover of darkness, we're going to move the entire army, every soldier that we have across the Delaware River. We're going to cross them after it gets dark and the crossing will be completed before midnight. We're going to cross in three different locations. We're going to have a diversionary attack. We're going to cut off the enemy's ability to retreat. And then the main body, which is going to cross at a place called McConkie's Ferry, is going, to, is going to land in the New Jersey side, about nine miles north of Trenton, divide into two converging columns, and then converge or come together at Trenton just as the sun's coming up at around 6 a.m. Take a minute. What do you think about this plan? Well, I know that you're not a military planner, and that's okay but maybe you've played countless hours of Call of Duty. Who knows? But if you're being honest and you're looking at this plan and you're considering George Washington and, and you're considering what the Continental Army has been able to do up until this point, you're probably thinking, boy, that sounds really complicated. And it is. It is a really complicated plan for a group of people who have shown no competency when it comes to executing simple plans, let alone complicated plans. There's no way this is going to work. And maybe maybe at some level or on some level, Washington knows that it's not going to work, but he doesn't have any other options. And folks, here, here's where we see one of Washington's greatest characteristics as a, as a military and political commander. Uh, when the chips are down, he is willing to take a chance. He is willing to gamble. You know, we're, we're going to see that. We already saw that on display with the retreat from Brooklyn. We'll see it again at Yorktown. 
But, you know, Washington is willing to take a gamble here. And this is a tremendous gamble. He uh, He's doing the poker equivalent of pushing all your chips into the, into the middle of the pot and saying all in. Not holding anything back. The challenge and password for the operation is victory or death. So these guys are going to be marching through a, a snowstorm or ice and sleet. And even if it's not icy or sleeting, it's going to be dark. So how do the soldiers communicate? How do you know if, if you encounter a British soldier or an American soldier? Well, the American sentry will say victory. And if it's an American on the other side, he'll say or death, victory or death. And that tells you something about Washington's mindset here. Either we win this battle at Trenton or that's probably it for us and for the revolutionary cause. Well, of course, this thing goes badly because it's Washington and it's his Ben. It's the Continental Army. So they, they had, uh, when they budgeted for their time, they, they were over generous. You know, they thought that they would be able to cross the river, the Delaware River, uh, completely by midnight. Well, they don't complete the river crossing until about three o'clock in the morning. And when they get the entire army over to the other side, they know that they still have to march nine miles before the sun comes up. And if they don't, they're going to lose the element of surprise. Um, the men are freezing in the in the area right on the other side of the Delaware, right when they, they cross and they get to, uh, well, what's now called Washington's crossing, two of Washington's soldiers freeze to death. You know, most of the men are trying to move around and stamp their feet and stay warm. They can't build fires. Um, and two guys like lay down and they never wake up. They literally freeze to death. What's worse. One of Washington's generals reports to him that their cartridges are wet from the crossing, which means they're not going to be able to ignite, which means the soldiers aren't going to be able to fire their muskets. And so their only other option is the bayonet. And as we've seen before, Washington's troops are reluctant to use the bayonet because they haven't been trained to do it. At this point, Washington has a decision. You know, he could get back into the boats and cross back into Pennsylvania, or he could roll the dice and try to catch the Hessians unawares. And that's exactly what he'll do. You've probably seen this painting before. This was done in 1851 by a German artist named Emanuel Lutz. Uh, it is one of the great paintings in American history. I think if you were to do a, a, a list of the top five most important artworks in our history, this would have to be on it. Um, people like to point out that there's, there's a lot of inaccuracies here. Well, Lutz painted this. So this is occurring in 1776. Lutz did this painting in 1851, I believe. Uh, he had never seen the Delaware river. So that's not what ice on the Delaware river looks like. Uh, he was more familiar with the Rhine. So this, this may be a better, uh, depiction of the Rhine river in Germany. Uh, Washington's men crossed on these barges that were used for hauling iron called Durham boats or Dunham boats. Uh, and that's, that's not a, a Dunham boat, of course. Uh, the flag is incorrect as well. The, uh, the flag that Washington's Lieutenant there is holding, that's Lieutenant James Monroe, by the way, we will encounter that guy again in American history. The flag that's being held there by Monroe uh, debuts after Betsy Ross sews it, we think, uh, but no earlier than 1777. So that, that year, that flag is about a year, uh, too early, but I love it because I love this painting because it, it captures Washington's spirit of intrepidity, you know, how brave he is. Um, some historians will say that everybody in this boat would have been standing. Some historians will argue that they all would have been sitting down. Either way, they're crossing and everybody's crossing. So there's Washington, bravely looking forward. Um, in addition to Monroe, um, 
another guy in this boat that will pop up again in history is uh, future Chief Justice of the United States, John Marshall. Also with, with Washington at this battle is future Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton. You've probably seen this meme before. It pops up like uh, every Christmas on Twitter or Reddit or whatever. So now you've seen it and you can tell all your friends it's the Emanuel Lutz painting. Orient you to the map. There's the Delaware River. Uh, to the west is Pennsylvania. To the east is New Jersey. McConkie's Ferry is on the Pennsylvania side. Washington will cross, divide into two columns about five miles down the road. Uh, one of his columns will be commanded by Nathaniel Green, his ableist commander. The other one by Sullivan. Washington uh, will ride with one of the columns and they will enter the city of Trenton. Well, before they can do that, Rall, who was the Hessian commander, very smartly put out some outposts just to listen and watch for any possible enemy activity. Some of those outposts are silenced. That's a euphemism for we kick in the door and we kill everybody inside. Some of those outposts are silenced personally by our friend Washington's young adjutant, Alexander Hamilton, who will go on to greater and bigger things after the war. And without the Hessians being, the Hessian main body being alarmed, the two groups of continental soldiers are able to fight their way into the city. And so we've got street fighting, bayonet to bayonet on King Street and Queen Street. And guys, if you go to Trenton today, the capital of New Jersey, King Street, Street and Queen Street are still there. You can still walk up and down and see these streets where Washington's men fought. And this is the first time in the Revolutionary War where, you know, rather than drop our muskets and run away from the Hessians, we're actually standing up to them and we're fighting them. And the main action takes about 15 minutes and the Hessians start surrendering. They take their muskets, they turn them upside down and bayonet first, they stick them into the ground, which is an 18th century signal for I want to surrender. So we capture almost a thousand Hessian prisoners and we capture nine of their artillery pieces, which we sorely needed. And the commander of the Hessians uh, was shot by an American sniper when he was on horseback. He's carried into the house where he was staying uh, and he dies uh, a very painful death having been gut shot. Before he dies, he surrenders his sword, meaning um, he formally surrenders his command to one of Washington's generals a guy by the name of Hugh Mercer, who was also Washington's doctor. So here's just kind of a picture of what it might look like. There at the bottom left hand of the map, you see the Delaware River. You see how Washington did his best to surround Trenton from three sides. So the, so the Germans, so the Hessians weren't really sure what direction or from what direction he was coming. Example of one of Henry Knox's artillery pieces at the Battle of Trenton. You see how small the field artillery pieces were compared to like naval guns. Knox was 26 years old. He becomes Washington's chief of artillery during the war. Uh, does good service at the Battle of Trenton. And then after the war becomes America's first secretary of defense or what we used to call the secretary of war. So a little bit about the outcome of the Battle of Trenton and some historiography of the Battle of Trenton. That means a, a history of history. There, there is a myth that surrounds the Battle of Trenton uh, that I don't think is fair. I don't think it's fair to the Hessians and I don't think it's fair to us. So the one enduring myth about the Battle of Trenton is that this was a sneak attack by Washington and we did it on Christmas because we knew that the Hessian soldiers, the German soldiers, would be up late at night singing Christmas carols and getting drunk. 
And there's no evidence that any of that was true. I mean, maybe they were singing Christmas carols, but these you'll have to, you, please remember, we've talked about the Hessians before, and they are the most disciplined soldiers in the entire world. And if they're not allowed to get drunk, they're not getting drunk. And all of the firsthand accounts from American soldiers who had fought at the battle, none of them talk about the Hessian soldiers being drunk or hungover or groggy. We just caught them flat-footed. So this isn't a sneak attack on drunken soldiers uh, on Christmas morning or the day after Christmas. Uh, it was just a really good idea by Washington and we got really lucky that we were able to pull it off. So a little bit about the myth versus the reality of, of Trenton. So what's the impact of the battle? Well, you can imagine that by 1776, Americans had gotten really down on the revolutionary cause. It looked like we were about to lose this war. And every newspaper, the day after Christmas, and in the weeks to come, all over the colonies, is retelling this story. And yeah, maybe it's not a large battle, but it becomes an important battle in the minds of patriots everywhere. Another one of the impacts of the battle is this idea that these, these Hessian soldiers were invincible or immortal is shattered at Trenton. And so at every engagement from now until Yorktown, we are more than happy to stand up to German soldiers and Hessian soldiers. You know, we don't, uh, we don't drop our, our muskets and run in the other direction as soon as they show up on the battlefield, like we did at Long Island and, and Kipps Bay and Elizabethtown. Another thing that comes out of the Battle of Trenton, which I like to point out, is uh, how well the Hessian POWs were treated by Washington. You know, there, there's a there's a unit in Washington's army made up of German speakers from Pennsylvania, and the Hessians are are going to be guarded by them. Now, you know, when you're taken prisoner of war by a, a European army, the expectation that the Germans had, that the, the soldiers had, was that they were going to be robbed, that they were going to be abused, that they were going to be ill-treated. And none of those things happen. In fact, they're treated so well that a lot of those Hessian uh, POWs desert from the German army and end up staying in Pennsylvania. It starts a long tradition that the American army has, that has endured to 2020, uh, where we are overly or exceedingly nice to prisoners of war. So much so that that reputation kind of precedes us around the world. So people can't wait to surrender to Americans. In World War II, we had, uh, we had German soldiers deserting their unit on the Eastern Front and traveling thousands of miles because they didn't want to surrender to the Soviet army. They wanted to surrender to the American army. You know, in, uh, in, in Desert Storm in 1991, uh, Iraqis were surrendering to CNN camera crews and drones. Couldn't wait to surrender to us. And the reason for that is because we, they knew that we were going to treat them well. So if you ever find yourself in, in charge of an army unit or a Marine Corps unit somewhere, just remember this conversation and, and remember that, you know, Americans don't abuse prisoners. Americans always take care of the people that surrender to us. And, and one of the reasons we do that is because we are enduringly good people. Another reason that we do it is because it's pragmatic. We want people to surrender to us because it, it brings the war to a, 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 a it hastens the end of the war. So this is the beginning of our good treatment of POWs. The other thing that, that Trenton is, is important or what makes Trenton such an important battle is, you know, this is Washington's first victory, not Washington's. Well, it is Washington's first victory of 1776, but it's not just Washington's first victory of 1776. This is Washington's first victory in his life. He's never won a battle before this. 
And so, you know, Washington, once he demonstrates he can win a battle, this, uh, this emergency, which was soldiers are going to, uh, not reenlist in his army is kind of over. In fact, you know, in the months and weeks to come, Washington is going to win another battle, the Battle of Princeton, take back large parts of New Jersey, and thousands of new recruits are going to flock to his banner where they will be trained partially by a European officer that we have not met yet. But that, of course, is a story for another day. <laughs>